Thanks, Bob. It's really a pleasure to be here. I guess, do, do I need the microphone? Yeah. Yes. OK, I will use the microphone. Um, it's really fun. I come back here probably every five years or so, and it's just terrific to see all these friendly, familiar faces with, of people with whom I've worked for a very long time, as well as some younger folks who I've gotten to know more recently. So real true pleasure to be here. And I have to start with a go Giants, right? <laughs> yeah, that was a nail biter. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the results of a focus group study that I conducted with an organization called AIDS United. Um, it's important to mention that because this is sort of a, a rare uh, collaboration, I guess I'd say, between someone like me and a national AIDS organization that was very interested in conducting a research project, a very community-based and participatory project, but didn't have the research resources in-house. So it's a nice culmination of some of the elements of the biography that Bob um, so nicely presented, where I could bring together my own threads from academia, advocacy, and organizational work. So without further ado, that's the wrong way. I think I have this upside down, don't I? Um, OK, so let me just dive right into this study. I don't need to regale you all with the data about the nature of the HIV epidemic in the United States. But importantly for this conversation, it's uh, imperative to remember that women in the US are affected by HIV in numbers that are not inconsequential, or as Peter would say, numbers that are consequential. That's too many negatives. Um, and what's particularly true about the epidemic amongst women in the United States is its disproportional impact on black and African American women, and to a lesser extent, Latino women, relative to white women. So most importantly, black women account for nearly two-thirds of new inf HIV infections among women, even though they're about 13% of the, the uh, population. We also see uh, reasonably significant rates of infection among young women. Now, it's very important for any of us to acknowledge that rates of infections have declined among women in the United States in recent years, as they have for other groups, except perhaps young uh, black gay men, young gay men in general. But we are at least seeing some declines in the epidemic, but there are still significant numbers of women already infected and becoming infected. So what's important, again, for our discussion today is that in the context of new developments in HIV prevention, we've seen the emergence of pre-exposure prophylaxis as one uh, very intriguing option that has gained really increasing currency in just the last year, I'd say. There was a lot of skepticism about PrEP until very recently. We can talk about that in the discussion. And there have been a series of clinical trials conducted throughout the world that established the efficacy of pre-exposure prophylaxis, and specifically oral Truvada, a once-a-day pill. Um, but none of them has included women from the United States. They were predominantly conducted in countries outside the U.S., but where there were U.S. participants in IPREX, for example, they were men, uh, and some transgender women, I should say. But uh, heterosexual women have not been included in these studies. And so we know very little, in fact, about what women know or think uh, about PrEP and whether they might use PrEP, even also, most importantly, after the FDA approved PrEP for pre-exposure, prof sorry, uh, Truvada for pre-exposure prophylaxis for men and women in the US in uh, July of 2012. So what uh, AIDS United and I did was conduct a, a uh, focus group study. We actually did this in two phases. The first phase happened before PrEP was approved. So that was in 2011 to 2012. And we conducted focus groups in four cities, Oakland, Memphis, San Diego, and Washington, DC. And then the second round was after PrEP was approved for both women and men in the United States by the FDA. And we conducted more focus groups in six cities. Uh, so we can see pretty well dispersed throughout the country, Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, New York, New Orleans, and Newark. And we defined women as at risk by virtue of their demographic characteristics, their social networks, uh, drug and sex use related practices, their, their socioeconomic status. And a lot of this was ascertainable because these were women seeking services or affiliated with service organizations in their communities uh, that related to sexual health, reproductive health, HIV prevention, and social support. So in fact, we worked directly with local women serving community-based organizations. And they did the recruitment. And we actually had a person from that organization or affiliated with them be the group facilitator who was trained in, in focus group uh, work. 
and we provided an incentive that was $50 in a cash or credit card. I think they were almost entirely Amex cards. Um, and so we began with a questionnaire that asked basic demographic information and some behavioral information, um, and then conducted these 90 minute or so to two hour uh, focus group discussions that asked, asked everything about basic, had they ever heard about PrEP once we described it, um, their attitudes about it, about uptake, administration, and what they thought would be the incentives or the barriers to use among women as well as some ideas about what are the best information sources and marketing uh, kinds of questions. So all the sessions were recorded and transcribed. We had two sessions in San Diego in the first round that were comprised of Latinas who predominantly spoke Spanish, so we held the sessions in Spanish, and those were actually translated. And we took the transcripts and analyzed the themes for uh, interesting observations as well as any potential site differences. So here again are the sites and the organizations where the focus groups took place and with whom we worked directly. Um, here's the comparative data from the two rounds uh, on basic demographic characteristics. As you could see in the second group, we oversampled specifically for black women, African American women, because of the disparate rate of infection and because uh, we wanted to um, understand what, if anything, those women knew about PrEP, of course. And the age distribution, we had uh, quite a range of age from 18 to 60. In some groups, there were more older women than you might imagine, but they certainly had lots to say. And we had equal rates of employment. About half the women were employed and half were not. And uh, strangely enough, we had in the first group, we had higher rates of education or higher levels of education, but slightly lower income <coughs> and the opposite for the second group. But generally, medium range, rate, sorry, medium levels of education and pretty low income. So here are the topics that we discussed in the focus groups. And we had an instrument and we asked the same questions in each group, but of course being focus group and very interactive and with very lively community women, the discussions went all over the place. But these were the general topics all groups covered. Uh, basically, simple, sorry, basic information about HIV transmission itself, as well as PrEP, and explaining how it worked and what it was. We asked if they'd ever heard about PrEP, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. We asked them which women they thought, uh, for, for, for which women they thought PrEP might be most helpful. And these were very open-ended. We didn't say this woman, that woman, this type of woman, that type of woman. We just let them tell us uh, which kinds of women. We asked them what they thought would be the barriers to uptake of PrEP among women, what they thought might be best sources of information about PrEP. And in, in that discussion came a lot of really interesting um, dialogue about the relationship that the women themselves had with their care providers, their primary care providers in particular. And as you'll see a little bit later, they had much stronger relationships than we might imagine and actually thought the primary care providers were a good source of PrEP information. We asked them if they thought PrEP would encourage more women to get an HIV test because we explained that you had to have a test and be HIV negative and get periodic testing. Um, we asked, instead of saying the sort of more pointed question about risk disinhibition, as everybody likes to call it, we asked them what did they think would be the impact of PrEP on a woman's sex life. And that included a discussion about would you imagine continuing to use condoms with your male partners if you were on PrEP. Um, and then we talked about the level of efficacy of PrEP, told them what had been ascertained in the clinical trials, and then asked them what level of efficacy they thought was important, as well as some other considerations that uh, came up in the course of the conversations. In the second round, we added a couple of questions based on the clinical trial data that had emerged from the VOICE study and previously from FemPrep that showed uh, no efficacy because the bottom line was that women in the trial, th these were the women-focused PrEP trials. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Um, and found no efficacy of oral pre-exposure pre prophylaxis, chiefly because women in the trials were not taking the pill. So it was a major uh, adherence issue. Um, and so we asked them, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, when we get there, about that. And we also asked them about different formulations because at the time and still right now, there's only one option for PrEP, which is Truvada. But there is research ongoing, as you all know, in other formulations and modes of administration of PrEP. So we asked them their thoughts about those. 
Okay, so let's get to the findings. So starting with which women did they think PrEP would be helpful for? Um, as you know, the FDA uh, approval in the CDC guidelines talk about some version of women at high risk or elevated risk or most at risk. And we wanted to ascertain what these women felt, you know, who's really at risk by asking the question, to whom do you think PrEP would be most useful? And we got a whole range of responses, as you can see here, across the board by age and, you know, if they're in and out of prison, if they're sex workers or drug users. And they had good language about each of these. But in the end, the most predominant response was pretty much all women including young women, anybody who's having sex because you don't know what your men are doing was sort of fundamentally the response. So they thought this was a, a methodology that should, would be appropriate to all women. And here are some of the quotes from, those, from the conversations in which you can see that the fundamental frame for that is not really knowing what your male partner is about, even if you're married as you can see from the bottom quote from the woman in Oakland. I'd go all women, meaning my answer to your question is all women, too, because even if you've heard married, too, because you never know what their husband's doing, and you don't necessarily want to trust. Um, so we asked them about barriers to uptake of PrEP. So PrEP is something that should be useful to a whole range of women, but what might get in the way of women taking up PrEP? And the first and foremost was lack of information. Uh, the other predominant themes were cost, uh, side effects, significant mistrust of the medical system and government, and that was uh, really apparent, particularly in the focus groups that were predominantly black women early in Oakland and Washington, D.C. in particular. Stigma came up, as well as a number of other issues that you can see here. So I've highlighted the ones I'm going to say a little bit about. Firstly, lack of information. Um, women were just PO'd that they had not heard about PrEP. We asked women, we explained what it was, and we asked, as you saw, had you ever heard about PrEP before this focus group meeting? And I would say we counted probably 10 out of the total sample both groups who'd ever heard about PrEP. And probably half of those were just from Atlanta because Sister Love is so engaged in PrEP work. But otherwise, women had not heard about PrEP at all. And they were angry about that um, once they understood the data from the efficacy study. So I didn't know it was on the market for women. You know, at, at best, they'd maybe heard it was something available for men, and particularly gay men, but nobody had ever heard it was available or reasonable for women. Uh, they want to know, why are we not hearing about this? If it's out there, what else are they not telling us about that might work? Um, and even, uh, you know, I go to these sexual health or other kinds of meetings, but nobody's telling me about PrEP. So we're not hearing about it. And this quote I wanted to put up here because the person was making the point that even the community-based organizations who serve them and to, you know, with whom they interact quite a bit, have not talked about PrEP, which makes them think they're not getting the information either. So it's not just the individual women, but the organizations who serve them have been deprived of this information. I, I trust I don't need to read these quotes, that you can see them well enough to read them, right? Okay. So um, one of the barriers that they identified besides lack of information, as I mentioned, was cost. We did not ask the women what might PrEP cost and what would you say would be an affordable amount for you to pay for PrEP or for your peers and colleagues to pay for PrEP. We just they mentioned cost as, you know, in an open question about what would be barriers. And they mostly talked about it sort of doesn't matter what it costs so long as it's covered by insurance, public or private insurance. Um, but the point that a number of the women made, of course, was you're talking about our population who were typically not well resourced or poor, and if you want us to stay HIV uninfected, you all have an interest in this, you're gonna to have to make this available to us at low, little or no cost to ourselves. We are the underserved, you have to make this available. Many of them said it should be free, in fact, if we're really trying to prevent HIV infection. But mostly the responses had to do with insurance covering whatever the cost. So another barrier that was identified were side effects. Again, we didn't mention this. They just brought it up, and this one got mentioned every time right out the gate. Um, and it really ranged from women talking about specific medications they were already on and one worrying about drug-drug interaction. A lot of them mentioned diabetes medications. Um, there was some suggestion, although we didn't get a lot of this, but uh, other groups have mentioned for women who are injecting drugs or taking other um, 
what's the right word, not, not legal, but um, illicit drugs, might there be some interaction, including would PrEP screw up the high, that kind of thing. So drug-drug interaction was uh, something that they were very concerned about, whether it would make them tired or you know, have just negative side effects. Now, what's funny is we read, them, not, maybe not funny, but we read them all the side effects that are mentioned you know, officially uh, as related to Truvada, and one woman said, well, that sounds just like HIV sort of suggesting which one's worse, taking the drug or having HIV infection. Now, another thing that came up, as I mentioned, as a barrier to accessing and uptaking PrEP among women was a general mistrust for government and industry. And we heard this, as I mentioned, particularly from groups that were predominantly African-American women and who refer to a historic lack of trust, even mentioned a famous Tuskegee study uh, and saying that, you know, we've had these experiences that uh, are not particularly positive with the medical system and with scientists, and we can't really trust what they're giving us isn't going to kill us, in so many words. You even heard to see the word genocide used. Um, and then they talk about, they were pretty familiar with Gardasil and um, the whole HPV scene and said that, you know, when they came in, they came in wrong, they came in the poor neighborhoods and were suspicious. So, you, you know, they had some pretty savvy uh, experiences and understandings of how science has happened in their communities and feeling to some degree exploited. So very much concerned uh, about the motivations of government and industry in these regards. And a further barrier, as I mentioned, was stigma. Um, and this is something that we know is true and part of the issue that underlay the low adherence in the clinical trials with women in Southern Africa in particular. And that is that if the little blue pill that is being taken for PrEP is the same little blue pill that is taken for antiretroviral treatment for people already with HIV infection. And so the pill itself is a signifier of HIV infection. So some concern that the stigma that still pertains to HIV would transfer to anybody taking that pill for whatever reason, no matter how you might explain to your partner or anybody else that you're using it for prevention. So it's the same medication for HIV. People are going to judge you and say, you know, you've got HIV and, you know, maybe you're positive and I'm not going to hang out with you and your friends are going to stop talking to you, that kind of thing. Am I speaking too fast? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> I'm among friends. I pass as a New Yorker, this would shock you, I'm sure. So switching from the obstacles and barriers, we also asked the women what might facilitate uh, uptake and uh, uh, use of PrEP. And this got at a whole set of sources of information. So how might you learn? Who's best for informing women about PrEP as well as providing services? And what are some good ways to market PrEP if you think it should be marketed? Um, and so we got, again, a range of answers from doctors to um, you know, methods of um, marketing, like using basic flyers even. There were a number of women you know, in communities like in the South where it, they were talking about um, much more sort of people-to-people -people kinds of modes of communication. So as I mentioned, we were a little bit surprised at how strong the relationships were between the women and their primary care docs or their OBGYNs. So mostly they mentioned providers right out the gate as sources of information and services. Um, but it was a very mixed response because they say we want to go to our doctors and we would, but we can't necessarily trust that they have the right information about PrEP, that they're informed because we never heard about this. So hearkening back to the lack of information barrier I mentioned earlier, they assumed that that was also going to be the case with their providers, that they might not be very well informed. And uh, a number of them said, you know, I would go to my doctor well equipped with information now that I've learned about it to make sure that that person, my provider, understands this as well as I do and we can have a, a reasonable conversation. So some suspicion about whether the doctors themselves are well enough informed. Um, but there were... Let's see, I think, yeah, but there were some women who said, I'm a little nervous about going to my doctor because if this person, if I have a good relationship with this person and she, she or he knows me very well, they're going to judge and say, well, why do you need this thing? You know, are you having sex outside your relationship? Protect yourself from what? Is you, are you or your husband sleeping around with somebody else? So she said, I think that will kind of bring shame and embarrassment for me, so I'm not sure I would bring it up. So there would be some reticence, as I think is true for uh, men as well. 
There were some interesting comments that some women made about learning about PrEP uh, rather from somebody who's already used antiretrovirals or uh, is in a relationship where, where they are being used. And so this uh, quote here from Chicago comes from a woman who was saying, I'd really rather hear about PrEP from someone in a serodiscordant couple effectively where somebody's taking the antiretroviral medication for treatment and has some experience about the side effects and how it affects their relationship and things like that. Because you know we really want to know how this drug is actually going to work. I'd rather hear from someone who's taken it or know someone who's taken it than for somebody in this person's words who's just sleeping around or something. So just a regular peer. So when we asked about um, others, when we asked this question, as I mentioned, generally about sources of information, um, there were other interesting responses, including school nurses, nurses generally. Um, we asked, you know, where the information should be given, and a lot of the women said in the schools, everything from primary school through college, and how important it was for young people to to hear about prep and young women to be learning about prep, and how, for example, in colleges you have student health services, and wouldn't that be a great place for this uh, education to happen. But at the same time, in thinking about the marketing of PrEP, uh, there was some concern about marketing, on the, on the one hand, recognizing the disparate risk of infection among black women, but on the other hand, marketing only to black women that could somehow target and sort of exacerbate stigma amongst uh, and to that community. So as you can see here, women from Memphis who, Memphis who said, if you target it strictly towards African American women, we're going to think again. We're going to think it's a government thing, or why us? So be careful how you target. So a number of other issues came up in the course of the conversation, um, or we asked about them. Uh, as I mentioned, the efficacy level, adherence, formulation, administration options, the impact of PrEP on sex life, condom use and risk compensation, which is, I think, everybody in the scientific field's concerns and public health concerns, and PrEP and testing, as I mentioned. So again, I'll talk about these quickly. Um, we told them what level of efficacy had been obtained in the various clinical trials of PrEP with men and women, and then asked them how efficacious, what level would you want to see before you would be willing to take the drug. And we really got everything across the board from 50% to 100%. A number of women said 99.999%, you know, want to make sure it works pretty much 100% of the time. But other women said, you know, if it's even 50%, it's better than nothing. Um, and as you'll see in a minute, they also thought it still would be used in conjunction with condoms. So uh, here the, the woman saying the pill is only going to do what it's going to do. I got to do my part too, which is engage in other ways to prevent infection. If it's 50%, I'll take it because it still <laughs> reduces my chance by that much. Um, as I mentioned, we also talked about what had been observed in the clinical trials focused on women, the voice and fem -trep, fem prep studies in particular, and the very low levels of adherence that were obtained, uh, observed there. And this is actually true of all the trials where adherence rates, even with men, were, were also very low. Um, so we asked the women, why do you think that even though these women were very much at risk, they're in high HIV prevalence areas, they know all manner of women and men with HIV infection, um, why do you think knowing that they might not have adhered to the drug that could prevent them acquiring HIV infection? Um, and we got a range of answers, and including, as you can see at the top, uh, an understanding of the incentives for participating in the clinical trials and all the kind of social supports and financial supports that go along, and health supports that go along with that. So sometimes it might just be the comp compensation some women uh, identified. Um, and, and how you're going to say you're going to do what the trialists want you to do to make them happy, but then you're going to just take the money and run. We also had uh, responses that related to women themselves not perceiving themselves to be at risk, and that actually has been observed by the researchers in uh, the voice trial, for example, and in FemPrep as well, that even in the face of a lot of prevalent HIV infection, individual women don't personalize the risk to themselves and see themselves truly as at risk. And so our women felt that that was probably a possibility as well. They also were pretty um, savvy in, in thinking about how PrEP works to say, well, what if they're not having sex all the time? Is this some drug you'd have to take every day, even if you're not having sex? Well, maybe the women in these trials felt like, well, I'm not having sex, so I don't have to take the drug. It was how they interpreted how the drug was supposed to work for prevention purposes made them think, 
well, it's only relevant if you're having sex, notwithstanding that we're told to take it every day. Um, and so maybe some of them just said, well, I'll just take it when I'm having sex. Um, and then they, of course, said, you know, a lot of people just don't like taking pills. That's true universally. And so maybe they just didn't take the pill because of that. Um, some of them really had judgment about women, said they're lazy or they're irresponsible. Uh, so I threw in a couple quotes to show you that. But that was not the most predominant theme. One woman was very clear in saying, you know, by the way, this is a pill, but it's more than a pill. And HIV is more than just an infection. And you're talking about a population that has a whole lot else going on in their lives, which is what we all as social and behavioral scientists have been saying forever, right? And so her point was that women may not take a pill. They may not adhere to the medication because of all these other things going on in their life. And so you have to not just provide the prep, but you've got to provide all kinds of psychosocial support services, and particularly to help women with their self-esteem so that they feel like they have the agency and control to, to manage their health and their HIV prevention. So um, again, as I mentioned, we described to them some of the newer formulations that are under study or, or methods of administration of PrEP uh, that women might be using in the future. So we have the currently Truvada pill. There might be other pills from other manufacturers. But there are also, as you know, vaginal rings being studied and injectables. And as you can see, when we asked them, which of any of these formulations do you think you might be interested in using, we got, again, the whole range from, of course, I'd take the pill, I'd rather take the pill. Um, but uh, the injectable seemed to be the most popular in, in many of the groups, and the vaginal ring the least popular, although there were some women who said they would use it, but they were concerned that something would be floating around in their system. They'd heard about um, the Nuva ring problems, in con the contraceptive ring. Um, and uh, some, some women just felt like they didn't want to deal with that, that sort of a, a, a method at all. Um, and, oh, sorry. And we had some suggestions for a patch. I'm actually not sure a patch is under study. Somebody else in the room might know better. I should know this, but, uh, but the notion that you could have something administered that isn't going to be really obtrusive, it's not coitally dependent, and all of that was, of course, very attractive. Uh, but in the end, the consensus was different strokes for different folks. You know, I'd prefer the pill, but someone else is going to prefer something else. Uh, we also had comments about the injectables being uh, probably very desirable for those who want the stealth factor, want to be secretive about their use of PrEP, that, you know, I can go in here and I can get it. No one's going to know that I got it. Um, but the point was that if we start opening up the conversation at all about PrEP, then people's... Uh, it, people would be more conscientious about HIV prevention in general, and so it really doesn't matter what the particular formulation is. So as I mentioned, again, we, um, asked, we did not ask about risk disinhibition directly. We asked about the impact of PrEP on sex life, because uh, we also wanted to know if they thought it might enhance their sex life. So um, we got a, a number of responses about the safety, you know, feeling more safe and secure, knowing that I'm taking something uh, in, that is going to protect me in addition to or instead of condoms that require someone else's participation. But it would be nice to be able to think about sex without thinking about blame, to be able to enjoy sex in a simple way without worrying that I'm going to get infected. Uh, and in San Diego, we, it turns out in the groups, we had a number of women who were in zero discordant couples, meaning that they were negative and their partner was HIV positive. And so I think they were particularly thinking about these possibilities. And again, so long as there's no side effects, because they thought the side effects themselves would affect their sex life. So when we got to the, the discussion of condom use, we did ask, do you think that uh, if a woman or male partner is using PrEP, that a condom would also be used as well? And most of the women did say yes. They certainly said they thought they should be used for the most part because of other STIs and pregnancy prevention. Um, but at the same time, there, and because you can't trust your man was sort of part of that theme as well. Um, but there was some sense that, well, not really, because after you get through putting on the condoms on, on and taking all the pills you're supposed to take before you sex, you're going to be dry, asleep, and tired. <laughs> so realistically, uh, maybe not. And even more so, again, the theme of you know, being too dry and disinterested uh, with condoms. So PrEP might be more attractive in that regard, but at the same time, um, 
you know, you really want to feel your husband in the course of sex. Uh, this woman was pretty explicit. It's like you want to feel, you want to really feel your husband or your significant other with just been condom, lubed and all that, you ain't really feeling the meat. <laughs> so you want the meat and you don't take it off. What if for one time you take the condom off and then that's going to start a, you know, a repeated process where that one time will turn into another time and then another time will turn into another time. So the woman would say to herself, well, we can do it now because the risk is lower, now meaning I'm on prep, uh, so I'm going to do it this time. So yes and no on condom use. We asked, uh, do you think that the availability of PrEP will encourage more women to get HIV tested? And there, too, we got mostly people saying yes, because if you know there's something out there that can really help prevent infection, you, and you know you have to be negative to take it, you're going to go and get your HIV test. Some women said maybe not, because the same people who don't test are not going to test under any circumstances. They don't want to find out that they have HIV if they have it. But in the end, this woman uh, said that, you know, people would take a test because if I know that they've got a pill that's successful, then I'm going to go get my HIV test to make sure I'm negative. Once I realize I'm, I'm negative, once I realize I'm negative, hell, give me all the prep pills you can give me. And we heard that kind of sentiment a lot. Like this thing's out there. We don't didn't know about it. Now that we're hearing about it, it sounds pretty reasonable. If everything else is equal and there's not terrible side effects, um, so you know, let's let's have at it. So that's kind of forecasting my conclusions that. What we would conclude from these uh, two phases of the focus group is that most women at US, in the US who we would define as being at risk of HIV infection, um, and even those who work with them and are members of their community are first and foremost still unaware of PrEP, although that may have changed in the last few months. And they're really disturbed that they haven't heard about it uh, in the first place, that many of these women did not consider themselves to be at risk, and they presume that others uh, who we describe as at risk may not see themselves that way. Uh, but with a demonstrated level of efficacy, with correct and complete information from trusted sources, with an assurance that someone else is going to pay for PrEP, whatever it costs, they really feel like PrEP should be available to all kinds of women who are having sex, regardless of whether or not they do perceive themselves to be at risk. The reason I keep mentioning that is because the, the guidance documents from CDC and the FDA's approval all kept emphasizing women and men at high risk, or high risk women as people are still called, unfortunately, and so put a lot of uh, emphasis on the notion of it's really for those who are at serious risk. And their point of these women is, don't worry about that definition. It should be available to everybody who's having sex. Uh, the women felt that condoms should still be promoted and encouraged for STI prevention, but it's just as likely that women and men will stop using them in the context of PrEP as they will continue to use them. And other than costs and side effects, including the impact of uh, PrEP on a woman's sex life or the side effects effect on a woman's sex life, and drug-drug interaction, uh, those are the most critical concerns that women expressed to us about PrEP. That, again, we concluded from the second phase that women are interested in all manner of formulations and methods of administration of PrEP, uh, but most, we, it seemed to us that the least appealing was the vaginal ring, um, although some said they would use it. I don't know why all this cackling is happening. So I think with that, I'd like to acknowledge the co-authors. This uh, study, actually the second phase project, is being published in probably February in AIDS Patient Care and STD. And um, I, with the co-authors named here, Vignetta Charles, Suzanne Kinski, and Gina Brown, the not OAR Gina Brown, the Positive Women's Network Gina Brown. Uh, and again, the sites, we want to thank them and all the participants and facilitators. We got some funding from Gilead Sciences for the second phase of the, the project. And uh, Maura Reardon, who works at AIDS United, really had the brain behind this whole project. So I think with that, I will close and we can have a discussion.